If you're like me, pneumonia is probably not the first side effect you think of when you're prescribing antipsychotics. It's probably not even in my top five, and I can't recall having ever included it as part of my informed consent with patients before starting an antipsychotic medication. I think much more commonly about a myriad of other side effects, including weight gain, metabolic effects, hyperprolactinemia, extrapyramidal symptoms, QT prolongation, NMS, and sudden death in older patients. Honestly, pneumonia is pretty far down on that list. Pneumonia prevention is also not really talked about in most prescribing guidelines for schizophrenia. Nonetheless, it turns out that pneumonia is a significant risk in patients on a variety of antipsychotics, especially those with high anticholinergic burden, and the risk appears to be dose-dependent. We'll be taking a closer look at this issue today, thanks to a recent cohort study in JAMA Psychiatry. I'm Scott Beach, and this is Quick Takes for the Psychopharmacology Institute. The study used data from the Finnish registry, including patients aged 16 or older with diagnoses of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. It covered a large time period, 1972 to 2014, and was thus able to include nearly 62,000 individuals, which suggests that it was well-powered to detect differences. Hospitalizations for pneumonia were examined in the context of antipsychotic use, examining specific agents, doses, as well as antipsychotic polypharmacy. During the study period, almost 9,000 patients had more than 15,000 hospital admissions for pneumonia. Strikingly, about 13% of those hospitalized for pneumonia died within 30 days, and it turns out that pneumonia is actually the fourth leading cause of death among patients with schizophrenia. Also notable, is that the risk for pneumonia essentially doubled every five years starting at age 50. Risk for pneumonia was significantly higher for men, especially above age 40. One of the more unexpected results from the study is the finding that antipsychotic polypharmacy was not associated with an increased risk for pneumonia compared to no antipsychotic use, but antipsychotic monotherapy usage was, and in a dose-dependent manner. We'll come back to that in a bit because it's worth a closer examination. Looking at specific agents, pneumonia risk was highest with quetiapine at doses greater than 440 mg, followed by clozapine at doses greater than 180 mg, and olanzapine at doses greater than 11 mg daily. The authors point out that these agents all have a high anticholinergic burden. None of the first-generation antipsychotics were associated with an increased risk. The finding that high anticholinergic burden drives the risk of pneumonia is not surprising, but it does help to clarify an issue that historically was a little bit muddy. As the authors discuss, there was previously a debate about whether dopamine blockade was increasing the risk by causing bradykinesia of pulmonary muscles, or whether the anticholinergic properties were increasing the risk for pneumonia via esophageal dysmotility and dilatation, as well as sedation. The findings of this study make it pretty clear that it's the latter, given that the three most implicated medications are all low-potency agents in terms of D2 blockade, but highly anticholinergic. The findings also suggest that the risk for pneumonia relates specifically to aspiration events. The authors do point out that agents with anticholinergic effects also tend to have antihistaminergic effects, so it's not clear whether there is additional contribution from antihistaminergic properties, including, for example, further heightened sedation. For clozapine specifically, it's also worth noting that the added effects of sialuria may further increase the risk for aspiration, while the presence of secondary antibody deficiency could contribute also to sinopulmonary infections. In terms of specific agents and doses that convey the highest risk, it's worth noting that the doses conveying increased risks for all three agents, again, that's quetiapine, clozapine, and olanzapine, are not as high as doses I commonly see used for schizophrenia. Though, according to the study guidelines, the doses for olanzapine and quetiapine were considered high dose, and the doses for clozapine were considered moderate to high dose. But if you think about it, 11 milligrams of olanzapine, for example, seems more like a medium dose compared to what we often see in patients with chronic psychosis. I guess the take-home here 
would seem to be that doses for these agents that are very commonly used do convey risk, and that doses many clinicians would consider to be in the true upper range might be even higher risk. Let's come back to that weird finding about monotherapy increasing the pneumonia risk, but polytherapy not increasing the risk compared with no antipsychotic usage. Breaking it down further, the authors found that high-dose monotherapy, though not low- or medium-dose monotherapy, was associated with an increased risk. In contrast, polypharmacy was not associated with an increased risk, regardless of the total dose burden. The authors point out that this finding is actually consistent with a prior study from 2023 showing that polytherapy may actually be safer than monotherapy in terms of adverse medical events. That study found that antipsychotic polytherapy was actually associated with lower risks of medical hospitalization, including a lower risk of cardiac hospitalization. These findings certainly seem strange and a little bit counterintuitive to me, but the authors of the current study posit that the use of high-dose monotherapy leads to saturation of specific receptors, in this case cholinergic receptors, whereas polytherapy may be more likely to hit multiple different receptors without achieving saturation at any specific receptor group, which might actually represent a lower risk in terms of pneumonia. So where do we go from here? It seems like it's definitely worth considering closer monitoring for pneumonia risk in older patients, particularly men who are on higher doses of one of the three most implicated agents, quetiapine, clozapine, or olanzapine. The authors don't go so far as to recommend screening swallowing studies in these patients, but they suggest that at least asking patients about their swallowing, and perhaps rudimentarily examining it in the office, may be a reasonable starting point. For patients who are on one of the high-risk regimens and develop pneumonia, it may be worth considering alternative regimens. I would always caution against reflexively stopping medications that have been helpful in the setting of an adverse event, though. Instead, careful consideration of the risks, benefits, and alternatives, and discussion of such with the patients and the caregivers would seem like a more prudent approach. 